This is the second video in a series in which I'm restoring this Creed 7B Mark I teleprinter. In the previous video I just gave a very brief introduction to it and uh, a very quick explanation of what it was used for. Of course it was used for many other things but, uh, but essentially it was used for sending electronic messages over a, a telegraph wire or a telephone line. So the way this thing's built, and I haven't worked on one of these before, I have worked on other teleprinters and they all kind of follow a similar theme, uh, but obviously the physical construction of each one is very different. And if you do get one of these, um, just be very careful taking it apart. The adjustments are uh, very fine. And I am lucky that I do have a, a good manual for this one. Uh, even so, I do need to take a lot of photographs as I dismantle it to make sure that I can successfully reassemble it. Um, the, the other nice thing about this particular machine is it's built in a fairly modular fashion. So we have the carriage assembly, which is a kind of single assembly. Uh, we've got the uh, solenoid assembly. We've got the print head assembly, the motor drive, and then the keyboard assembly. I'll go over each one of these and exactly how they work in more detail as I come to restore each one. But as a very brief overview, this works a little bit like an electric typewriter, a very old electric typewriter. And with regards to the encoding of the data, this is a 5-bit machine. And the way the encoding works is there are a series of uh, encoder bars that sit uh, along the length of the keyboard. And it works a bit like a bicycle combination lock, in that when you press one of the keys, then when the machine is actually running, it causes the encoder bars to all run up to a certain position. And that position depends on where the individual tabs are set on the individual encoder bars. So in other words, they will all be driven to a different combination of positions depending on which particular key that's pressed. And that is then used by a, a kind of encoder system to create a series of pulses and those pulses are dependent on the combination that's set on these bars. So what we have in here is a, a kind of encoder switch system and this is used to turn the position of these encoder bars into the required um, ones and zeros that's transmitted down the phone line. And then the reverse happens when data comes into the printer is used to determine which of the particular character bars to impact. So this works a little bit like a daisy wheel printer where there is a, a separate, a separate uh, punch pin for each character that can be printed and the assembly is driven round depending on the code that's received to align the particular pin which is on this um, reel down here with the impact head. And then there's a series of cans in here that are used to drive this uh, hammer to drive the, um, the pin against the paper. And then the whole thing's synchronised with a series of levers and gears to make sure that everything happens at the right time. But as I said, I'll go into more detail as we come to uh, restore and rebuild each particular section. What I want to do in this video is just strip the machine down into its major uh, modular parts and then I can start looking at cleaning the parts, disassembling them, and I'll do a separate video for each major block. So the first thing I want to do is remove the carriage. As I say, I haven't worked on one of these before. I had a, a read through the manual. And what we should be able to do is just lift this off uh, intact. So I think we have to do is loosen this off. And then pull, push that lever. Further. And then that moves around. So I'm trying to reach around the camera here. And I can lift the entire carriage off in one piece. So I'll put that to one side. Okay, so that's the first major piece off. The next piece I want to take off is the keyboard assembly. I'm not sure if this will be quite as easy, but uh, let's have a go. I believe that we just need to take these two screws in it. I 
I'll just reposition the machine so you can see it a bit more clearly. OK, so I'll finish taking these screws out. And then I believe that this entire assembly should disengage. Which it does, there are some wires down there onto something. So I'll see what they're connected to. There's two wires down here, so I can't pull the keyboard any further forward, but it is, it is mechanically detached. There's just a, a clutch system here that's used to uh, couple um, this mechanism to the main motor drive. So I'm just going to take a few photographs and then find out what the wires are connected and then uh, get back on camera. OK, that's a lot easier than I expected. The uh, keyboard's actually plugged in, so um, very nice design feature there. Uh, what I've done here is take a photograph of the relative orientation of this part of the mechanism relative to this so that when I reassemble it I can make sure that the timing of the relative parts is correct and um, the entire machine relies on mechanical timing and if uh, it's put together wrong then obviously it's, uh, it's not going to work. So I don't want to turn anything until I've taken some um, photographs and some notes as to how they are arranged relative to each other. I'm sure that the manual will have some information telling me how to um, realign everything, but it's quite a big manual, so I'd rather um, take the safe approach and have some good photographs and some notes. Uh, one thing that's worth mentioning with machines like this is the gears are um, a form of paxiline, so it's, it's basically it's um, resin impregnated cardboard almost. Um, they're not very strong, they're quite resilient in their normal use, but um, they're quite easy to strip. So if you do get one of these, I strongly advise you don't start by plugging it in, because almost certainly parts will be seized up, and all you will do is strip all the gears, and then you'll have a major problem trying to get it uh, working again. Okay, so I'm just going to have a, a quick uh, look around. The next thing I want to get off is the motor. I'll get the keyboard out of the way. Okay, so I believe with the motor we just need to disconnect the wires that go into it and then take this end bracket off and then the entire motor should just slide out. Um, that's the theory. Like I said, I've never tried this, so uh, fingers crossed it will come apart. Finished taking this second screw out. Now, because these were made for military use, they do tend to be assembled in such a way that they are field repairable, so that's um, the theory, we'll see if that bears out in practice. So there are some wires going from this box into the motor. It looks like it might lift up with the motor. So that's uh, extremely nice design, the whole thing lifts out in one piece. This end uh, path is the governor, it's a centrifugal governor. And it runs on the two brushes that's just effectively an open close switch that interrupts power to the motor as it speeds up. But as you can see this whole thing's made in a, a very nice way and um, once everything's been cleaned up it uh, will have a high chance of getting it working again. Things like the capacitors I will replace. This is only a 24 volt motor, so it's not particularly high voltage, but I will probably replace these anyway. They are coming up for 100 years old. Okay, the next thing I want to try and take off is the solenoid. I'm hoping that it's uh, also plugged in. There's just two screws holding it in place, and we need to disconnect the linkage. So I'll try and get the linkage off first. Take the screws out and see if it will simply unplug. It's quite nice that the screws aren't uh, rusted in place. It's obviously been fairly well looked after.
Okay, let's see if this will now lift off. So again, extremely nicely designed, very serviceable. Let's hope this continues. So next I'll remove the ribbon and the ribbon supports, get those out of the way. And now I should be able to unscrew the ribbon drive supports and get those out of the way. Um, I wouldn't normally have rewound the ribbon, but this um, side has completely seized up, so I'll have to free that up before I can get it to turn. Okay, so that's the first one. And I'll do the same thing on this side. So, I'll take the shaft out later, but we'll get the print head taken out next. I'll just uh, have a quick look to see exactly what's involved in doing that. Okay, so I've had to take a few more parts off to get access to the mounting screws for this assembly. So I'm just removing the two screws that hold this assembly in place. I'm leaving the base where it is, simply because um, I don't want to have to try to realign it afterwards. It appears we have some sort of switch system down here, so what I'll do is uncouple this and take out the blocking plate. Okay, that's that plate out of the way. And hopefully I can now remove this. It looks like I'll probably have to take the second bracket off, so remove the top bracket. And hopefully I can now lift this thing out of the way. There we go. That's the cross drive shaft. Okay, so I completed that part of the disassembly off camera. It got a bit um, complicated in the end and there was nowhere to get it apart without taking the major castings off the base so I'll just have to realign it uh, when I come to reassembling. So what I have at the moment is the base. It still has uh, quite a few parts on it including the um, electrical wiring which is underneath. I'll look at that in the next video. Um, we have the cross shaft, the uh, main part of the indexer and cams, keyboard, the punch head, we then have the um, print select head, various bits and pieces, the carriage, motor, solenoid and the um, uh, ribbon supports and various uh, bolts and screws. So what I'll do in the next video is look at working on the base. I'll finish stripping it down and then that can be cleaned up and I can start um, reassembling that particular part of the machine.